all right okay so let's quickly recap some of the important points we covered yesterday uh, while discussing this point number nine which is on the distinction between we have to make this much smaller now guys at the last on the last bench satyam can you read this you can't read it okay so then we'll have to just make it bigger and then we can't see both the columns together now can you read better one more this last <laughs> Asset class specific indices as long only benchmarks. Can you read this on the last bench? Okay, fine. So we just have to live with the fact that we can't. And anyway, most of the stuff on the right hand column in the right hand column is the opposite of what's on the left. Okay, so we've covered most of these points. Yesterday we had focused specifically on this point, which is active versus passive management. Okay, uh, so uh, I don't know how we got into that discussion, but anyway, we kind of skipped over to point number nine. <laughs> So the point is that uh, uh, the, the question that uh, Sushar asked and in response to that, we were discussing that in the context of the shift, big trend that is happening in money management, okay, which is that there's a, a seismic shift of capital from active management programs to passive management programs. It's really driven by three things. One is that the underperformance of active managers, which has persisted for many years, okay. And uh, then uh, if we go back here, one minute, let me just... What do you think? If I shut this thing down, will it stop the recording? It's a player. Why should it stop the recording? Yeah, if I minimize, it should no longer be an active window. But when I'm toggling through windows, I think I'm just going to take a chance and shut it. And it does not affect the recording. There's some kind of bug. I don't know why it's launching that player. Okay. All right, guys. So, uh, in this uh, on this point number nine i'll just uh, where did we discuss that shift of uh, so let me just put it into point number nine i'll just write down the point so that you have a chance to uh, because we haven't yet come to point number nine actually uh, this okay so active the shift of capital so um, uh, for this trend we have three uh, uh, factors which we should just write down so that you should know this uh, underperformance uh, underperformance uh, relative to benchmark okay underperformance of active managers I'm going to use short forms okay so active managers, underperformance of active managers relative to ma benchmark. Then higher fees of active managers. All right. So the logic is that if I'm paying you higher fees and you're underperforming relative to the benchmark, which is usually a passive equity, in which is an equity index. Okay. So then the, uh, the investors are going to say, why should I pay you more for getting to get less performance? I might as well directly invest in the equity index okay. through a passive program and pay much lower fees. You got the logic? Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going kind of basic. We're going through the pro logic once again, but I want to make sure because very often we find that the, during the exams, the kind of answers we're getting, uh, it shows that people haven't really understood. Okay, so make sure you understand every step of the logic. So higher fees of active managers. Uh, underperformance of active managers relative and of course I mean um, let's put it this way relatively higher fees okay um, so obviously then uh, the lower fees of passive managers I'm not going to mention that as a separate point because it's related to this point which is uh, active managers have higher fees and they're underperforming relative to the benchmark and passive management basically involves investing in a benchmark okay when you look at this is this is one of the good examples of passive management if you look at um, this most actively traded ETF in the world, the SPY, which is essentially a ETF that tracks the S&P 500 index. Okay, those gaps that you are seeing is because the market is opening at different levels from the previous close. That's why you see the gaps on the chart. Okay, and this thing, uh, the charts are made only for regular trading hours. It does not cover uh, the performance over the, um, I mean, the what is called. 
uh, outside regular trading hours. Okay, so this is your S&P 500. This is actually it mimics the movement of the S&P 500 in index. This is SPY, the actively traded ETF. So instead of paying managers extra fees to underperform relative to this benchmark, which is the most common equity benchmark for equity mutual funds, for actively managed equity mutual funds, you might as well pay much lower fees, invest in a passive fund, just go buy this ETF. That's passive management because this ETF is mimicking the S&P 500. Okay. So therefore, it's much cheaper to do this. So therefore, people are saying, why should I bother to pay you extra money? That's one. Second is that the other important point, which is the more complex point, which we uh, discussed, okay, which is that the monetary policy response to the uh, GFC, which we discussed in detail yesterday, uh, this has led to basically uh, a drop in correlation between assets. Uh, let's call it uh, between markets okay so the drop in correlation has happened as this is a more important point which I discussed yesterday which may be a little complicated which is that so obviously what you have is you understood the monetary policy response which we discussed yesterday to the GFC first aggressively cut interest rates and then you see that nothing is happening growth is not picking up even though rates have been cut so aggressively then what you start doing is you start doing quantitative easing which means the central bank goes into the market and buys bonds outright okay mm -hmm. government bonds then uh, government guaranteed kind of semi-government uh, entities like Fannie Mae Freddie Mac or mortgage-backed securities okay mortgage-backed bonds those bonds so government goes and the, the Federal Reserve goes and buys all this kind of stuff so obviously when they are buying bonds they are selling what currency, currency okay currency. so they are buying bonds and they are selling us dollars and so the money's uh, money supply in the system is increasing so they are flooding the system with money essentially to encourage people encouraging the banks to lend yes. and creating an atmosphere like don't worry you know it's like don't worry it's like uh, kind of pampering a child don't worry we are going to be there with excess liquidity in case of any credit crunch so go ahead and take risk essentially encouraging people to take risk mm -hmm. so as a result of this what happened was because the system was so flush with uh, liquidity that everybody started piling into risk assets and essentially the, uh, this is the important subtle point that normally when you look at the fact with uh, normally when you look at the drivers of risk assets okay if you look at something like yesterday we discussed Tesla okay we can look at this it remains a very interesting stock so if you look at a, a Tesla you'll see why is it an interesting stock because they have a bond payment coming up in March there is some cash flow issues you know they recently announced a big layoff a uh, bunch of other six, six seven thousand people they're laying off because they're trying to cut costs trying to move down the they want to sell slightly cheaper cars okay so they can have more volume so all these things so if you look at Tesla if you look at the equity analyst com community's views on Tesla there's a very big divergence there's a very big split okay <laughs> Uh, a lot of people are saying this company is a disaster and about 50 percent are saying this company is the future company of the future and all that so a lot of the point i'm trying to emphasize is that if you that you, are, you agree that this is a risk asset common stock of tesla is a risk asset okay so normally when you look at any risk asset there's a whole bunch of different factors that are driving the returns on risk assets so here you have what's going to happen to battery technology how well will bmw and porsche and all these players how well will they come into the electric car segment so there are all kinds of other dynamics that are driving all kinds of uh, you know varied dynamics that are driving the price of risk assets you understand what i'm saying yeah. in a normal situation there's technological uncertainty competitive behavior okay all kinds of general economic growth etc uh, consumer sentiment all these factors but what is happening is because the the central banks flooded the system with liquidity okay so aggressively that the excess liquidity became the sole driver of everything because everything was going up okay people were just piling into risk assets without regard to any kind of other factors because they had a sort of carte blanche from the central bank saying that you know go ahead and buy take risk so the excess liquidity started driving all risk assets up together so as a result of that what happened is that the correlation between assets collapsed i mean the core sorry i, I wrote it wrong what i meant was uh it should not be drop in correlation it should be the, the opposite okay mm. rise in correlation between markets okay markets assets same thing okay because you're trading the base asset in any market so what happens is because see, one single factor liquidity is driving all assets as it becomes the dominant factor driving all asset prices so what happens is that differential normally if you're looking at copper copper will have different factors driving it than lead than aluminium then 
iron ore, coal, there are different dynamics. But if what is happening is if one single factor is driving, has become the dominant force in all markets, then all markets start moving together. Okay. So therefore, what happens is, especially in the traditional asset classes like stocks and bonds, uh, everything started, all stocks started going up. Okay. So what happens is here the uh, relative performance of as active managers becomes much more difficult to, uh, much becomes much more difficult for active managers to stand out. Do you understand why? Like yesterday, I gave you an example. How do active managers outperform? They pick on, they do stock research. Okay, so they would look at all the stream, streaming companies and they would take a view that okay, Netflix is going to be Netflix is do you know their strategy is much better. They are going to do much better than other companies like Hulu, and they're going to take away share from a lot of media companies like you know Time Warner and all these other companies. So this, uh, uh, so therefore, there has to be some kind of first of all, some some stocks have to behave differently from other stocks. Okay, and then you have to be right to catch those big winners like Netflix and Facebook and those kind of companies. Like the classic example is if you look at Facebook versus Twitter. Okay, if you look at uh, Facebook first. So Facebook has suffered a lot recently, but if you look at let's look at weekly charts and see. All right, and then if we compare this to. Okay, so you can see the difference in performance that Facebook in that same period, okay, obviously starting from here where the data series because the Twitter IPO came later. All right, so here you can see that Facebook is up about 285% and Twitter is down about 20%. Okay, so but there are lots of VCs who also invested in Twitter when they started out, then in say, let's say in 2014, nobody knew that there was going to be such a big difference in their performance. Okay, so this is how active managers make money that they are able to select particular stocks. Okay, they're able to select particular stocks which are going to do well and uh, the, you know, uh, sh sell stocks which are not doing well or avoid those stocks. So the point is if everything is being if all risk assets are going up together. Okay, if all stocks are going up together because of excess liquidity, it becomes much harder for active managers to outperform because everything is going up. So there's no special uh, treatment given to people. Uh, no special rewards are given to people who are able to select better stocks. Are you are you able to see what I'm saying? When you guys go out, please make sure you shut the door properly. Are you able to see what I'm saying? Yes. Okay, it's not a very convincing yes, yes. but maybe you can think of Okay, good, good. I'm glad you've woken up. Okay, so, uh, all right. So anyway, so think about this. So these are all factors and you need to be aware of this trend. I just wanted to be, we're not going to spend more time on this because we've already recorded all this stuff. Okay, so this is basically the po point of what is going on. And uh, uh, this is the, the, these are the factors driving this. Uh, you need to be aware of this trend, which is the shift of AUM from active to passive management. All right. So there is rising competition in markets and index. Yeah, well, the markets, the, if you see the markets and index are not really kind of independent because what is an index? S&P 500 is a average of 500 stocks. Okay, it's a weighted average of 500 stocks. So in some sense, there is, uh, you know, whenever you're tr tracking any of the stocks, individual stocks against which are hap which happen to be in the S&P 500 also. There is some element of uh, double counting because that stock is also inside the average, right? So, so the, the so the market the index the market index is actually just nothing but an average of the stocks. Okay. So, what was your question? So basically, market is correlated with the index. Exactly. Yeah, in the, in everything can tends to go up, so that will also happen. That if the overall index is also going up, and individual stocks tend to uh, coalesce more closely to the overall index performance. Okay. So therefore, basically everything goes up. So uh, it becomes difficult for uh, people who are distinct, uh, who are more discerning as active managers to uh, outshine the passive management, uh, uh, you know, uh, programs. Okay, guys, let's move quickly to, we need to finish this topic so we can move on because we have another project to deal with in this semester. Okay, uh, so this, we've covered all the points. Okay, all these points we've already discussed and, um, Okay, I just want to add one more point about the high water mark. So remember that when we go back to point number seven on the distinction between TAM and AM. So what is the broad, how would you roughly summarize the difference in compensation? Correct. Okay, so if you want to just quickly understand uh, the difference between compensation in AM and TAM. Okay, 
that in TAM there is no incentive fee. <laughs> there is only a management fee, which shows up as the expense ratio of the mutual fund. Okay. Mm -hmm. And in AM, there is all there is a management fee plus an incentive fee. But you need to be aware that some managers, in order to distinguish themselves, like I mentioned, Tudor, Tudor Investments, okay, uh, they did not charge management fees. Only incentive. Yeah, only incentive fees. In which case, the incentive fees uh, are much, some of the incentive fees are much higher than 20%. Yes. Like there was this guy called Steve Cohen, who is one of the top equity traders. So he had this fund, fund called SAC Capital. So they used to charge, I think, 30% of excess profit. And he also, I think, didn't have a management fee. So he would charge 30% of profits, where the industry standard is 20% of profits. Okay, he would charge 30% of profits. But he made a lot of good money for investors, so people were still willing to invest with him. Okay, so uh, that that firm has now become known as Point 72 Asset Management. They have an office in Singapore as well. So if you come across Point 72 Asset Management, that is nothing but uh, Steve Cohen's firm, which earlier used to be called SAC Capital. Okay, so they were shut down because of some regulatory problems. Some of the guys were involved in insider trading and things like that. So, okay, so we've covered most of the points. So I just wanted to spend a little bit of time on uh, on uh, compensation. Where is compensation? Okay, so here there's no incentive fee. And just one point to understand this point that I put in here, that the incentive fee is only paid for profits above a high water mark. Have you heard this term before? High water mark? high water mark use your common sense if you are sailing or something like that if you are uh, involved in something to do with the sea sir benchmark we can say high water mark can be termed as a benchmark for example uh, if they have set a benchmark of 20% mm. so if the profit is uh, if the profit is more than 20% then only they will get this incentive yeah but there is a difference between the high water mark and the benchmark i'll come to that so what you're mentioning is yeah that what you're actually describing is a benchmark okay let me just go back to the spy chart to understand what a high water mark is high water mark is simple use your common sense if you're a sailor what is a high water mark when you're looking at the shoreline you can see the water line even when the tide has gone down you can see from the water marks on the let's say on the pier or whatever you can see from the water marks what was the previous highest level of the water when we had high tide yes. Yes. that's a high water mark yes. okay you can see that on the pier okay so that's what it is okay so uh, let's see here let me just why is this weekly okay we should have more data here i want to capture the 2009 decline okay all right so this is your s p 500 being proxied by the spy etf all right, so this is, uh, you guys should have a sense of economic history also, important historical events. All of you guys should be aware of the internet bubble, which happened in like the midnight, uh, second half of the 90s to 2000, peaking in 2000. This is the internet bubble, okay? Uh, and then you had the decline from the internet bubble, and this is again the housing bubble, or you can call it the mortgage, uh, the residential uh, mortgage backed securities bubble, okay? So the housing bubble essentially, that was the, un that was the underlying asset and then the bonds were created the mortgage-backed security so this is then this is the crisis september 2008 lehman brothers goes bankrupt so this is the bursting of the housing bubble all right okay so this high is actually slightly higher than the internet bubble high all right so now imagine that this is not the spy this is somebody's fund performance so we're trying to understand what is a high water mark okay because remember the incentive fee is paid as 20 percent of profits okay so whatever you make you get 20 percent if you are a standard uh, alternative asset manager so now let's imagine that this this is actually the plot of the guy's total uh, asset value you start out let's say this is zero we start out with zero we start out with 45 dollars okay and then you start making money and you go up to here which is you made about 156 dollars 57 dollars okay so every quarter the money gets paid out so from here to 45 to 157 or 158 you've made all this much money so you've earned the 20 percent of profits of the difference between 158 and 45. is everyone following okay what any any dissenting voice i thought i heard somebody okay anyway so now please don't be worried to uh, about dissenting so what i want is people more people should actually complain when they when they haven't understood 
because okay so now the the fund performance starts to decline okay now we are here we've reached a low of 73 so after having made 158 raise the asset value fund value to 158 the net asset value of the fund has gone to 158 and then it starts losing money and then the fund fund comes down to 75 let's say okay and then it starts to recover again so now the question is suppose this has happened in one quarter it has gone from 75 to 115 now should this guy be should this guy get 20 percent of the profits between 115 and 75 no, Akanksha is very confident she should not she would not going to pay him why correct so this is below the high water mark he's already earned this so the point is that the incentive fee that so when you're discussing this entire topic of alternative asset management versus uh, traditional asset management okay uh, when you're looking at the difference in the compensation structure uh, between am and tam one of the things is the incentive fee okay is what what is not present in tam but then how does the incentive fee get paid in am that also you should be clear about and that is the profits only 20 percent of profits above the high water mark okay so you need to make fresh money because you already think of the logic of this you've already earned 20 percent of the profits from here to here okay so you can't be paid now for recovering from 75 to 115 okay that would be double counting your profits okay then that's life is too bad <laughs> you got to shut down that is one of the reasons why you'll notice that after a big decline in the market okay and many times we see a lot of correlation between markets even today or sporadically that happens if there's a big decline like you notice this fall in the stock market the oil price decline also is kind of more or less uh, you know similar i mean it happened at the same time okay mm -hmm. there was a sharp decline in the oil price remember after trump decided to give uh, exemptions yep. to yep. the iran because the price of oil had been bid up because of the fear of iran sanctions in november 2018 and then suddenly he decided to give a lot of sanction uh, a lot of sanctions relief to india and uh, some other countries china Six yeah First yeah japan china so suddenly then the market realized that there isn't actually going to be a supply shortage and then dramatic uh, there was a dramatic collapse in the oil price okay so that kind of stuff i think it was kind of more or less uh, slightly off but uh, it is uh, more or less at the same time you could say okay so now what's happening here is uh, sorry what was the topic i was discussing high okay the, i was responding to that point that uh, what will happen what, what Tanu just saying that what happens then if you don't earn your incentive fee so you will notice when there's a sharp fall in a lot of markets okay like oil and other, and a lot of hedge funds make lose money and then you'll find in the immediate aftermath of that that kind of drop dramatic fall in the markets a lot of hedge funds will close why because i mean they close because they can't afford they're not earning the incentive fee and they have high overheads and they can't afford to pay their staff okay so they have a lot of analysts and a lot of it people etc compliance people running a hedge fund is quite a complicated business because there's a lot of compliance burden as well nowadays so there's a big over i mean there's pretty high overheads everybody understands what overheads is yes okay what is overhead solanki banker what is overhead costs. yeah but what kind of costs <laughs> No, let him answer no? banker he's going to be analyzing balance sheets very soon <laughs> see I mean, I, okay please go ahead revise i'm not going to spend class time deciding you please learn from your friends and revise okay uh, okay so the point is basically they have a lot of fixed costs okay which they're going to have to incur whether they are doing any business or not okay whether there's any uh, selling going on production going on there are some fixed costs which have to be incurred so they have paid salaries to these analysts and it people compliance people okay so all these fixed costs so these guys have to shut down so you'll notice that the hedge, lot of hedge funds will shut down after there's a market collapse because they they, uh, they are so far down the funds are so far down they're kind of like here okay they kind of like here and they know that they're not going to they're going to take a long time to recover to this level remember this is the funds pnl we are looking at okay so they're going to take a long time and these guys what they see is that it's not going to be possible for us to recover the fund take the fund back to those levels and we have such high overheads we better close down the fund 
Okay, so you'll see a lot of hedge funds closing in in the aftermath of market uh, sharp market declines. You return the money to investors. Okay, so all right. So leftover money means obviously from here. Only this is only what you can recover. This has already been lost. You can't return this because you've already lost from here to here. So here you just dissolve the fund and return the money. Okay. Sir, we can go either up or down in M. So we can take the highest low, the lowest lows. As the no, no, I, I didn't get what you're saying. Use the mic since we've taken the trouble to use the mic so that it gets recorded. <coughs> yes, I can see here some murmuring going on. Uh, please don't talk and uh, yeah, go ahead. In Nam, we can go anywhere. We can even buy the shares or sell the. Mother, we can buy the asset or sell the asset. Yes. So we can take highest watermark as watermark as the lowest low. No, 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 no. Let, let's be clear about one thing. Okay, this thing which I'm showing you now, although it's actually the chart of the SPY ETF, <laughs> I have pretended that this is not the chart. This is actually a funds NAV. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I have forced it, forced you to assume that this is the NAV of a fund. Okay. So this is your fund performance. Mm -hmm. So this performance may have been achieved by shorting stocks or by buying stocks. Uh, yes, if you are an alternative asset manager, you are allowed to short stock as stocks as well. Yes, sir. There are many funds which are. Did I tell you about somebody who is a dedicated short seller? Let's test your memory. Yes. I asked you to follow three people in the market. Jim Chenos. Jim Chenos. Good. Jim Very good. At least I, I, I'm impressed that at least some people know, remember this stuff. Okay. So Jim Chenos, uh, who, who runs Kynikos Asset Management, who famously shorted Enron. Okay. He knew about the problems at Enron. Okay. He, he sort of cottoned on before the market realized it and he went short Enron. Okay. So, uh, so he runs Kynikos Assets. He's a dedicated short seller. So this could also be uh, the Kynikos and Evi. Yes, sir. So when it's going up, it's not going up because they're buying stocks because it's the NAV of the fund. It's going up because they're selling shock stocks at hundred dollars and maybe buying them back at seventy dollars. Yes, sir. All right. So have you understood? Is that does that answer your question? No, sir. Okay. What's your <laughs> what's your question or what's your point? My question is that sir, it does not depend on the NAV of the firm. Sir, alternative asset management, you can go either uh, down or you can go either up. So no, no. The one second. Let me understand. One. Let me understand what you mean by going down. Or do you mean that you can either go long the asset or short, short the base yes, asset? Yes, is that what you're saying? Yes, okay. So don't say down or up. Say no, we are allowed no, to go no, either no. long or short the market. Yes, it's not yeah. Proper yeah. yeah. Not using proper terminology. Very correct. <laughs> Gaba is the class monitor. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So we can either go long or. Okay, guys. Let's not have all this murmuring in the background when he is talking. Yes. We can either go long or we can go short. Yes. So, sir, if we go short, then also we are uh, making the profits. Why is there some noise coming? I can hear a female voice somewhere murmuring. Okay. All right. Yes. See, when we are I, I've kind of lost. Uh, it's very disturbing because I've lost. Uh, uh, so, you're saying that yes, we can go either long or short. Yes. Okay. Sir. Yeah. So, then the lowest low should also be the incentive price, uh, highest watermark for the incentive price. You're saying something like this, this one, this one somewhere here, yes, sir. and somewhere here. So can we mark that as the first lowest? Which one? This one. This one, sir. This one. Yes, sir. Okay, this is the L1. L1. Then this is L2. This is lower than the lower than L1. L2 is lower than L1. So yes. This, all, this should also be the highest watermark. L1 should be the highest watermark. And if the person goes below L1. No, no. Okay, one minute. Let me just explain. You have not understood high watermark. Okay, who is talking here? Is it Bhatia? Okay. I can hear some female voice constantly talking. Okay. Um, you have not understood high water mark. Sir, high water mark is basically the no first no no you use it use the mic when you are talking. So what I understood that the high water mark is basically the highest point that the hedge fund is making from that investment. Yeah, but the language is not correct. Talk in terms of NAV. <laughs> you guys understand NAV now? <laughs> NAV is the same thing that IB calls uh, an NLV in its account statement. Net you know, net liquidation value. That's also the net asset value of the fund. Okay, the mutual fund language is NAV, and even in other funds, even in AM, this language is used. 
so use the mic so let me first explain before you ask your question so let, let this be the plot imagine that this is the plot of the NAV of the fund yes sir so when you start with hundred dollars and you make a 50 when you made an absolute profit of fifteen dollars okay assuming no brokerage and freeze have not been charged now the NAV of the fund is hundred and fifteen dollars is this clear so this is the plot of the NAV of the fund so when it's going down it's because the fund is losing money it may be losing money on short trades or long trades so does that now clarify your doubt how do you know you make the one minute one minute let's not confuse this this chart now I'm forcing you to believe that this chart is the plot of the NAV of the fund Mm -hmm. sir, we got that, sir. You got that, right? Yes, so now, what? If you are, how, how are you making the statement that <coughs> if we are going short, we are making money? There's no guarantee that you'll make money every time you go short. Sir, are you one minute? One minute. Let me just pin him down. Sir, Do you realize? <laughs> no, no, no. Let's come back to your statement. Let's come back to your statement. You made a statement that the fund is making money because it's going short. Yes. yes. Is there any guarantee that you'll make money just because you went went short? It can be. You might make money or you might not make money, right? So why did you make the statement that the fund is making money because it's going short? May make money. May make money. Yeah, may is fine. Yeah. So so what is the problem? I'm not able to follow now. No, one sec. Tanuj, are you clear about the enemy about the high water mark? Is everyone else clear about high water mark? Have you understood, Lakshay? Have you understood high water mark? The high imagine this is just examples when the person will get the incentive piece. So I'll give you the example one minute. Okay. So even here, okay, one sec. Just imagine this chart. I know for a fact that this particular high is higher, slightly higher than this high. Yes, sir. Okay. So when you fall so all the way from here to here you've made money, you've enjoyed the entire difference between say whatever that 158, 158 minus 45 into 20 percent. Okay. You got that. Now the fund starts declining. Okay. When it starts to recover again, you are making your 2 percent management fee because that fee is being paid for a different reason. That's not a performance fee. That's a management fee for the, for to compensate the manager for the effort he's putting in exercising his brain and uh, you know trying to select the right stock to buy or sell okay so for that effort he's being paid the two percent management fee that's why the management fee now the incentive fee i'm coming to that one sec let me just finish suppose now it goes to let's say 160 or let's say 161 for the sake of argument now you go to 161 okay if you close one if you have a quarter in which 161 is a high uh, you make 161 now you will get the difference between 161 and 158 which is the previous high water mark yeah so you'll get that difference into 20 percent you'll get 20 percent of the excess profits is this clear okay now everyone is clear about high water mark which is logical because you get money you get paid only you don't get paid twice for making the same return because you're just recovering so yeah. that means this is all is done in one single uh, so when the person buys uh, you're not using the mic properly that also has to be learned the mic voice should be coming through the mic <laughs> so now it's fine yeah so this is first outright position because the uh, manager is not making a uh, long position again and again uh, after uh, after an interval of time you know manager could be doing all kinds of things he could be taking spread positions unwinding spread positions because you can make money even on spread positions you can make money on repos which we discussed yesterday repos are a spread position when you do a repo what you have is a spread position remember because yeah so repo we decided we'll call it repo because globally it's called repos in the major financial centers okay so remember this uh, please make sure you understand this that when you have a repo position mm -hmm. when you've done a bond repo mm -hmm. you do not have an outright position in the bond can you see the logic for that because what have you done if you're let's say a dealer Morgan Stanley you have sold the uh, you have done a repo with the US Federal Reserve okay mm -hmm. in the first leg of the repo you have sold the bond to the New York Fed yes, sir. but you have also agreed that you are going to buy back the bond after 14 days mm -hmm. yes sir so do you have a net position outright position in the bond no sir because you have a short on the first leg and you have a long on the back leg yes, so you don't have a net position net. and the amount of the bonds uh, the quantity of bonds is the same mm -hmm. it's just that the price on the back leg is higher yes sir. because to pay the interest to the central bank yes, okay are you following no, no, sir. so 
Okay, so you have to recall your definition of spread position. Remember, we discussed spread positions, huh? Yeah, not just we discussed it in the context of hedging, but spread positions can arise anywhere. Okay, where you don't have an outright position. Remember, we did we not discuss that the spread position can be, or maybe we didn't discuss the entire definition of spread position. Spread position can be same. We did discuss it. Intermarket. This is what. So the repo is what kind of spread? Intra market or inter? Intra. Is everyone clear? Yes, sir. Himani. Repo is what kind of spread? Intra market or inter market? One minute. One minute. Let me hear what she's saying. I N T R A. Yes, T R A or T E R? T R A. Okay. All right. So is everyone clear? Kalra, you're clear. Repo is an intra market spread. The nodding is not convincing. Okay, make sure you understand this. Okay, so going back, so we did discuss. We did when we discuss spread positions, when we define spread positions versus outright positions, we did define spread positions comprehensively, and we said that uh, if you have the same position, long or short, long and short, long here, short there, or short here, long there, at different points of time in the same market, that's an intra-market spread. Like oil. Yeah. You can do long oil for December and short oil for February next year. Okay. So now, does everybody understand that a repo transaction is an intra market spread? Yes. Everyone is clear? Yes. Because you're in the same market. Okay. US Treasury bonds, let's say 30 year US Treasury bonds. You have sold in the first leg, you have bought back in the second leg. So you do not have an outright position, you have a spread position. And in particular, this is an intra market spread. Everyone is clear? Yes. Okay. So, uh, why did we get into this discussion? We were discussing high water marks. Hmm? Yeah, so I was saying that one minute. Okay, guys, please. You can make, you could have made, this is just a chart, this is just a plot of the total value of your fund. Every time you make money, the total value goes up. Every time you lose money, the total value goes up, goes down. Okay, this is the cumulative balance of your fund that is being plotted as a time series. This is a time series plot or a uh, cross-sectional data plot time series. time series okay so this is a time series plot of the value NAV of your fund this is NAV of my portfolio you, know, you can call it your portfolio okay good <laughs> okay good Tanuj are you also clear okay good so high water mark has everybody understood now okay so we took a lot of time to understand uh, to cover this point but that's the whole point of the of having a class and coming to the class okay so make sure you ask good that she's got another question so it doesn't matter if you are able to cover only maybe maybe 30 or 40 percent of what we plan to cover but the point is that whatever we have covered in the class that should be totally drilled into your brain for your lifetime you should never forget it okay all right yes Mansi. Sir, if we are keeping, uh, for example, in the next quarter. Okay, me. While she's talking, I don't want to hear any noise. Yeah. Sir, if we are talking that uh, in the next quarter, he has made a similar difference or no difference in the previous high. For example, it was 158 earlier. Yeah. And today also, uh, after three months or one year, it is yeah. 158 only. Yeah, okay. So he is maintaining that uh, position. And yeah. That uh, so he should get, uh, why should we take only the difference of the profits? He is maintaining the portfolio, the person who is investing is also getting the return. No, what are you saying? That Are you saying that let's say in quarter one, let's say quarter one, the uh, NAV was 158 yeah. and quarter two also NAV is 158. Yes, so you're saying that he equal should still. Equal and above and or over and above. Is it, uh, if it is equal, then also he's getting the information. No, then you tell me, above. you tell me how you want to pay that. Based on that, I'll decide to manage oh. your money. <laughs> will you if I have made if the quarter one NAV is 158 and the quarter two NAV is also 158 will you pay me an incentive fee for quarter two no sir no sir no growth there is no growth there is no growth so incentive profit is for uh, incentive fee is for uh, extra profits that you made incremental profits is this clear okay good Yes, so let's have that. Let's have more people. Any any, any kind of doubt, please uh, ask questions and clarify. It doesn't matter if it uh, slows us down because the whole point of having a class is to clarify doubts in real time. Okay. Otherwise, because of what we are seeing is a lot of material has been covered and the retention is very, very poor. In your batch, I think the retention is even worse than your, pre than your seniors, is what I'm seeing overall. 
okay so please make sure you understand otherwise what's the point of spending all this time and money going through this program you could have used your life in a you know you could have used your time better maybe gone to Haridwar and meditated or something okay all right <laughs> So okay, so we were. What were we discussing? Um, about high water mark. Right, high water mark. Okay. So on the point of point number seven, the point seventh point of distinction, compensation, no incentive fee in TAM, and how is the incentive fee paid in AM? You have to be aware that you get the incentive fee. Incentive fee is only for profits above a high water mark. Okay. All right. Okay. So only one point left to discuss in uh, this particular subtopic of TAM versus AM which is the dominant forecasting paradigm have you guys heard of the word no the markets the standard is 22 and 20 okay just like in the market in the real estate market if you rent a house probably the if it's a one year uh, you're renting for one year you have to pay the broker one percent one month's rent as brokerage now you may negotiate with your broker and make it 15 days that's different but the standard is one month's rent okay so similarly here the industry standard is 2 and 20 but as I said, many well-known funds like uh, uh, Tudor, uh, like uh, SSE Capital used to charge 30%, okay? And maybe even Oak Tree charges higher because they have a hurdle rate. I don't know what their cut of the, what exactly, what is the percentage their investment fee is? What percentage, okay? But the general industry standard is 2 and 20. So I've taken 20 as an example. Is this clear? Yes, sir. Danuj? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So the uh, point number eight, that is the distinction is, have you guys heard this word paradigm? Paradigm. paradigm is a paradox. <laughs> okay, so he is already dreaming of paradise. Okay, you are already dreaming of paradise. Okay, you should wait a little bit. Okay, now uh, paradigm. So nobody knows what paradigm is. Paradigm is a worldview. Okay, it's a way of looking at the world. You can say socialism is a kind of paradigm. Capitalism is a certain type of paradigm. It's it's a comprehensive, think of it as a comprehensive, uh, you can look up the dictionary meaning also, but I'll just give you the general meaning of it. Paradigm is a general, it's a comprehensive uh, uh, system for, you know, a governing or way of looking at things. It's a comprehensive, uh, you know, way of looking at things. So you could say capitalism. Yeah, you could say it's a bird's eye view, but essentially it's a way of looking at things. Okay, so it's like a socialist paradigm is different from the capitalist paradigm because in the socialist paradigm, the government is going to own all the means of production. Okay, there is no concept of private property. Okay, that's why in India, when the I think when the Muraji Desai and all came to power, they had removed the right to property was a fundamental right under the Indian Constitution, but they removed that. Okay, after the emergency, when they came to power. The Janta government, they removed the right to property as a fundamental right. It is no longer a fundamental right, it's just a legal right. Okay, because they had a socialist orientation. So they felt that the fundamental right to property is a sin. So private property is frowned upon. So but so the point of a paradigm is that it covers many aspects. It's a way of looking at a system or looking at the world and it has many aspects to it. Okay. So communism is a paradigm, communism or socialism, because it deals with many aspects of your life. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's what paradigm means. So a forecasting paradigm, when we get into the discussion of models, okay, and predictive models, we will discuss uh, the different paradigms once again in more detail. But the point is that fundamental analysis is a par paradigm. Technical analysis is a different paradigm. Okay, just like capitalism is different from pro socialism, because on the important points like private property, in capitalism, we give a special place to private property rights. In socialism, we don't. Okay, so in that sense, technical analysis is a different paradigm from fundamental analysis. Okay, does everybody know the, does everyone understand the difference between technical and fundamental? Okay, what, who's going to answer the difference between Nimish? Who's there at the back next to Keshav? Nimish, why don't you educate us on the difference between, give him the mic. Difference between fundamentals and technicals. So the, 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 the info that we are giving you is that in TAM, the dominant forecasting paradigm. You're, first, let's understand what is meant by dominant forecasting paradigm. So you understand that in any kind of money management, forecasting the market will be an important job. Yes, sir. Okay, that's an important problem to be solved. A decision problem, is this going to go up or go down? We discussed the decision problem of whether to buy or to sell. Remember? One decision problem if you're trading in, let's say, trading in copper. One decision problem, basic decision problem you're going to have is, should I buy copper or should I sell copper? 
okay so that is actually connected to the forecasting aspect of it so obviously if your forecast says that copper is going to go up then you are going to sell okay so no, no i'm just testing you i'm just testing whether you're sleeping or not okay you'll go long sir that is a long you'll go long okay so one minute so so therefore i'm just making a very obvious connection but we still should highlight the obvious things why is forecasting related to this decision problems because the decision problem that you face when you're trading in any market like say copper is that should is, is you don't know whether you should buy copper or sell copper okay to start out with okay as, as a starting position so to do that you need to get into this business of forecasting because obviously you'll make a forecast about the copper market and if your forecast is bullish then you will buy and if your forecast is bearish then you will sell so that's how forecasting is related to the decision problem okay so that's why we worry about forecasting so what the what we are saying here on point number eight is that in tam the dominant forecasting paradigm is fa mm -hmm. okay we are only going to say fa and ta now we don't want to keep using these long words like fundamental analysis and technical analysis but in 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 am both of them are used okay kind of almost you could say uh, at least 60 40 fa 60 percent and 40 percent you could say ta but here it's almost 100 percent and no tam manager would be caught dead uh, admitting they may actually use it but they won't admit it no TAM manager is going to be caught dead admitting that they use TA, okay? Because for them, it's almost like a religion that we don't believe in TA, we only do FA, all right? So this is what is, so now you understand what we are saying yes. when we talk about dominant forecasting paradigm, yes. okay? And I've used the word paradigm because yes. FA is a comprehensive approach. It's a way of looking at things. When we do the distinction, the detailed analysis of FA versus TA, which we are going to do later on when we look at the decision problems in more detail. But right now, uh, Nimish is going to educate us on the difference between FA and TA. Yes, go ahead. What? You don't know the difference between FA and TA? <laughs> you tell us, we don't want to waste time. You're sitting there like, okay, then pass. Who Tanuj will educate us? Who will educate us? Sahil will, Sahil will educate us. Okay, okay, Le okay, let's give Sahil a chance, then we'll go to Achal and then Gaba. Okay, quiet, please. There's talking going on from this side. I don't want to hear any sounds. Okay, Satyam will lose points. Who's who is which group is Satyam in? Gaba. 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 See Gaba, you got to keep your you got to keep control over your people. Like Achal controls her own people, but she doesn't control herself. <laughs> so Gaba, Gaba has also opened his account. All right. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. So, uh, Sahil, yes, go ahead. FA versus TA. Sir, I think that we analyze the balance sheet or market value of the company. Sir, all the fundamental analysis, that all the theories we apply for calculating the actual value of uh, the asset, that is fundamental analysis. But technically, all the what? What do we apply? All the? Sir, theoretical or uh, sir, theoretical knowledge and the market uh, knowledge uh, to calculate the value of asset. Okay. So they actually come at the value of asset. Then mm -hmm. what should be the today's uh, current market price of the asset? What should be the market price of the asset? Uh, and what kind of inputs do you use? So balance. We can use balance sheet, profit and loss statement of the company. So all the past trends. All the past. Trends. Past trends also. No. Trends of what? Sir, so so but not not everybody together. Okay. Then let's watch your TA. So, uh, DA is uh, analyzing the charts. keep track, make sure that not more than one person goes out at a time. Yeah. So, D is analyzing yeah. charts. Uh, what is the trend uh, uh, of the share uh, of the market, of the asset, uh, whether it is uh, bullish or bearish? Okay. Okay. Don't say bearish. Bear. bear. I know you like to drink, but don't say bearish. <laughs> <laughs> say bearish. Okay. All right. Okay. Achal, what is Achal's reply? Let's have some. The guy, quiet, please. Let's have some uh, quick replies and then we'll discuss it. Technical analysis, we are not concerned about the past trends or what is the balance sheet. We are concerned about the price that is going on, current price uh, that is there in the market of a stock. And in uh, fundamental analysis, uh, we see how the company has performed. Still talking going on. How a company has performed over the years and what's the industry trend and everything. But in technical analysis, we are just concerned about how the price is moving. 
Okay, Kaba, you want to say something? You want to add something to that? To what they have said? Yes. <laughs> so fundamental analysis uh, is related with the uh, company's current past financial record. Don't read. Don't read from. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the fundamental analysis are just related with the. Uh, it, is, it is the main evaluation of the company's intrinsic value uh, of the securities, and then it is compared to the security value uh, to determine which position we have to take. And then further, we look at the past records or the future records and the. Uh, How can you look at future records? Two prediction models. Yeah. Record is something which is recording some data. How can you look at future records? Like um, when uh, you're standing today, you don't know what the future is. A technical analysis is related with the price movement of the uh, of the stock of the company. Okay. Anyway, all right. So uh, most of you have some idea. So Achal also explain it. But you made some. Uh, some of you may. Uh, some, uh, I think Achal you made a statement saying that we don't look at past trends. That's not true. The way to distinguish, we'll discuss it in great detail later on because there's a lot to the distinction between TA and FA. Okay, but the basic point in technical analysis is that first let's define TA. In TA, we are only concerned with market related activity. Okay, anything generate any information generated by the market. So price action, volumes, you know that there's a concept of volume. Okay, you can figure out every day how many shares of uh, so many of ITC traded today, right? Spoofing. Yeah, spoofing is. No, no. What are you saying? You're you say, saying so many things. <laughs> spoofing will not. One minute. Let's understand. If spoofing is done successfully, it will not contribute to volume because volume is only traded volume. Okay, so if you and I, go, we are both on the NSE and you put in a buy order for 1000 shares and, and I put in a sell order for 1000 shares and the NSE matching engine combines us, okay, makes us meet and do a transaction, then the volume in ITC is recorded as 1000 shares only when there is a trade. So if you remember what spoofing was, if spoofing is done successfully, he will remove he will remove the order before it gets hit. Remember, you are placing false orders without any intention to execute yeah. to scare people mm -hmm. so if spoofing is done successfully then it will not contribute to volume okay so the point in technical analysis the point to understand is that technical analysis is uses as focus on what the inputs are okay focus on what the inputs are for ta and fa in ta the inputs are all market generated information market activity generated information which means what is the price okay now we go back to treating this not as a, a na each plot but treat it as a SPY price. So if I'm making a forecast on the SPI based on TA, I will look at all the things that are coming from market generated information. So what is the price? I look at the time series plot of the price. Okay. What is the volume? What is the open interest in SPY? You won't have open interest, but if it's a futures contract, you'll have open interest. So all kinds of data that is generated by market activity, that is trading activity. Is everyone clear? <laughs> this is the basic difference in input between TA and FA. In TA, this is our only input. We are not concerned with anything else. GDP, inflation, balance sheets, leverage ratio, this, that. Nothing is of interest to us except for what is generated by market uh, trading activity in the market. Price, volume, open interest, etc. Okay, and any kind of calculations you can do. Here you can have all these kinds of indicators. These are where are the indicators and strategies okay so if i look at the snp plot i can have all kinds of um, let's have um, any kind of let's have a chai kin oscillator i don't know why it's not responding okay we are not allowed to use it in the free version okay oh sorry it's because i don't normally use indicators so we can see Chaikin oscillator, okay? Chaikin oscillator is nothing but, we don't have to get worried about it, but uh, this has been, the point is that this is calculated purely from the raw price data in the upper panel, okay? So in TA, what you use, what you have to understand about TA is, you have to be clear about the inputs. The inputs can only be those in things which are that kind of information which is generated by trading activity in the market. So price, volume, open interest. And on top of that, you can do all kinds of manip manipulations by uh, calculating technical indicators. But this Chaikin oscillator is a complicated calculation. 
but the point to understand is that the input for this calculation is only the data in the upper panel so you can divide this data log of uh, n period minus you know root of previous period all kinds of stuff you can do but the point to understand is that the raw data is coming from only the price figure in the upper panel is this clear okay so in ta what we use is basic information generated by trading activity in the market and all kinds of permutations and combinations and calculations on that raw data okay by calculating all kinds of indicators there are literally thousands of indicators okay and they are all based on the, uh, the same they all have the same property this that they're calculated from the basic high low open close information that is coming from the market remember when we looked at charts high low open close mm. remember all that yes. in each period you have high low open close okay open high low close if you did if you looked at candlestick charts on your own right so you have open high low close so it's coming from that by manipulating that information you can come up with all kinds of complicated formulas which become your indicators you just saw how many indicators exist how many options exist on indicators okay so i'm just going to remove that so now everybody has a sense of uh, ta you understand what ta is all about so understand the philosophical aspect of it also that you are not concerned with anything that does not come from trading activity in the market okay but the point that archel made is not correct she's saying that it's not based on pa uh, past trends but you do focus on past trends so in technical analysis you do as long as your input is you're clear about the input the input remains pure the input is only information uh, emanating from trading activity in the market so on that information you can do cross sectional data you can do time series data so if you're doing time series data then her statement is not correct which is past trends of prices and that's a very important factor actually in ta so the past trends of the market because sometimes you might look at different kinds of uh, patterns okay so if you look at for instance if you look at uh, is this us oil you will do different types of patterns all right so you might look at different types of patterns so we do look at past prices so this is historical oil data you can see the volatility so you might actually look at some kind of patterns like inverted head and shoulders you might say these are like two different heads and this is the neckline okay and this is sorry these sorry these are the two shoulders this is the head i'm just giving you a flavor of it we are not trying to, we are not really trying to understand this pattern i'm just giving a flavor of what people do when they're doing ta they look for patterns they say that okay this is a head this is the inverted head and shoulders this is the head this is the left shoulder right shoulder there's a neckline and the price is broken out from the neckline and therefore it's going to go up so this kind of stuff is done in ta okay now fa is all about so everyone is clear about ta now okay fa is all about fundamentals so let's look at let's look at the stock screener to give you an idea okay so fundamentals means if these terms are actually not very good okay because fundamentals doesn't tell you anything about what what fundamental i can say that technic i can say that market price data is also fundamental so this fundamental is not very uh, illustrative this term just like technical is not illustrative okay today we know that okay now that i've explained to you know you know that if you go to some company and people are talking about technical analysis you know what it means but uh, but if you look at it on the face of it this term is not illustrative what do you mean by technical i can say all kind of stuff is technical yes. okay so uh, so therefore these terms are not illustrative but we this is what people use in the industry okay so we need to be familiar with these terms but in in fundamentals what we use in fa is here again you have to focus on the inputs what are the inputs the inputs are essentially all kinds of macro and micro economic data and in micro economic data i am including even company specific data that is all the financial statements everything okay so i'm stretching the definition of microeconomic data but it is actually part of microeconomic data because when you do microeconomics you do your average cost firm marginal cost all these things that's a firm level data so in microeconomics the concept of firm level data is included so the short way to remember the inputs of fa is all types of macro and microeconomic data including you will also bring in elements of geopolitical analysis like this whole business of the iran oil sanctions when people were thinking about the iran oil sanctions and what it will do to the supply of oil now what's going on which country is facing a lot of political which major major player in the oil market major major producer of oil 
is facing tremendous unrest? Venezuela. Venezuela. Good, 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 good. You're making me feel a lot better today because people are at least plugged in. Okay. So Venezuela, remember that Venezuela has the world's high, has higher proven oil reserves than Saudi Arabia. Yes. Okay, and today they are in absolute turmoil. People are like eating dogs. There's no food in the supermarkets. There's like a lot of now there might be a, another coup or something because there's a political tussle going on between Maduro and the new guy Guaido or somebody. So there's a lot of uh, problems. So Venezuela. So all this analysis that you do, okay, like what's going to happen if you're an oil analyst? You have to be concerned with what's going on in Venezuela because their oil output used to be three million barrels per day. But because of all these problems over the last four or five years, it's now come down to near actually below 1 million barrels per day. So if that even 1 million barrels disappears from the oil market, what will be the impact on the price? When you're doing all this analysis, okay, this will also be categorized for want of a better term under FA. Okay, so all geopolitical factors will also come under FA. Okay, so although mainly when we think about FA, we think about macro and microeconomic factors. So price will increase. The yeah, Ceteris Paribus price will increase. Okay, but you have to look at all the other actors because US shale output is increasing dramatically. The US is now pumping more than 10 million barrels per day. The US is the biggest oil producer in the world by a wide margin now. Mm. Yes. Okay, so the US shale oil output is, uh, is a big factor in the oil market. Okay. So it can go both ways, you know, it can suddenly it can shrink because of, uh, you know, all kinds of problems. Okay, so that is what you do in FA, uh, macroeconomic and microeconomic analysis. I'll just show you briefly how to use the stock screener if you want to play around. Those of you who are, you can, you can do a lot of testing on this here. See, they already have indicators. You can play around with this. You go to fundamental, you can do all this kind of stuff if you're doing value investing should i forward pe are you following what's going on here yeah. so if i'm a value investor let's do a check on value investing many of you messed this question up also in the in the answer in the last in the last exam i i, I explained to you the difference between howard marks and Va warren buffett yes. as investors mm -hmm. okay yes. or maybe the question was as value invest uh, i think I, I left out the value investing part but the point is you will not typically hear of uh, Howard Marks being spoken of as a value investor because typically when the industry talks about value investing, they focus on equities and Howard Marks is focused on debt. Okay. But you have to understand the basic, the fundamental approach in value investing is it's a mean reversion or a momentum approach. Mean, mean, reversion. Reversion. mean reversion. Okay. So value investing, the fundamental approach in value investing is we wait for a market panic okay so the market can so that the market can actually uh, uh, ends up selling in that panic the market ends up selling a particular asset down so sharply that the price of the market price of the asset is far below its fair value that uh, interesting term that he used which is correct that good that you're using the term intrinsic value <coughs> which is what uh, sahil was also getting at but you didn't use that term fair value or intrinsic value okay so there is a fair value or intrinsic value let's say at hundred dollars and in a market panic, people have sold down the asset price to maybe $30. So that's when the value investor is going to sweep uh, to, to jump in. The value investor is going to jump in and buy that stock in the expectation that there will be mean reversion. It will flow back to the, the asset. The asset price will move back to the fair value of the asset. Is this clear? So if you understand value investing from this kind of fundamental theoretical perspective, you will then understand that Howard Marks is doing exactly the same thing, but he's operating in a different asset class in debt and in particular in, in distressed debt. But, uh, so it's company specific debt, etc. And sometimes sovereign debt. So yeah. Okay. All right. So is everyone clear about this now? Difference between many of you got this question wrong in the exams. Different between Howard Marks and, uh, and uh, the Warren Buffett as investors is both are value investors. So you should have explained what is value investing in these general terms that it's a species of a mean reversion strategy. Value investing is a species of mean reversion strategy. Do you understand this sentence? Yes, sir. You understand the way I'm using the word, the language, Ayushi? Value investing is a species of mean reversion strategy. Is everyone able to follow? Yes. Now, you should give me a similar statement from what you learnt in lab in your law course. Similar, by similar statement, I mean that if I say that uh, Bupesh lives in Dwarka, 
you make a similar statement and say that GABA lives in Rohini. So in this similar way, if I'm making a statement that value investing is a species of mean reversion strategy, right? Go back to your law course. Everybody listen to this because I'll ask other people and make a similar. Is everyone understood? Is, is, is my question clear? Yes. I'm saying that value investing is a species of mean reversion strategy. Now go back to your law course and make me a similar statement from your law learning. What is a species of what? Pass the mic to Shivam. Well, be, all contracts are agreements. So, but you're not using the word species. I want to use the, I want you to use the word species. Value investing is a species of mean reversion strategy. So you have to, whatever sentence you utter, you have to use the word species. <coughs> quiet, quiet, quiet. Yes. Okay, we'll go to Shivam. Yes. So agreement is a species of contract. Agreement is a species of contract. Okay. Anybody else? Any other input? Sir, sales of goods act is a species of premium contract. Okay, sales of goods act is anybody else with any other input? I saw lots of people murmuring here. Double A two. You want to say something? My question is clear. I think the question is clear from the type of answer that I'm getting that whatever you say from your law learning you have to say it in this structure X is a species of Y okay so anybody else wants to contribute debt is a species of asset debt is a species of asset that statement is correct but it's not coming from law I want to get something from law I want you to tell me something about what you learned in law nobody anybody else no one is able to tell us no, no, one minute. I want to get this answer from the class. <laughs> Correct. So finally, Shivam has zoomed in on. He had parked his car the wrong way. But now he has zoomed in on the right answer. That contract is a species of agreement. This is the answer I was looking for. Okay. Your answer is also correct, but it doesn't come from law. That's why I focused you on law. So if I say contract is a species of agreement, then um, which is a smaller, which, uh, which set has fewer elements in it contracts or agreements listen to my question contracts has few what is my question if i say that contract is a species of agreement then which set has fewer elements in it contracts okay so now you understand okay good but i'm surprised to see that nobody was able to tell me from law what we studied because we discussed this point many times okay no 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 that is total rubbish no <laughs> not correct <laughs> total. i don't want to denigrate what you're saying but that was totally uh, that was not correct okay i shouldn't have used the word rubbish i don't want to discourage you i you are welcome to say anything in the class but that is totally wrong that is not correct okay all right okay guys now okay guys please so you understand what I mean by saying that value investing is a species of mean reversion strategy yes. because there can be many you can I can show you mean reversion strategies in TA. Okay, so that will share some proper common property with value investing because value investing is a FA approach or TA approach. FA. 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 Okay, so value investing is only fundamentals. They will only look at these kind of factors. Okay, so so in value so i can show you a ta approach using oscillators which is a mean reversion approach so that there is a common property between that and value investing because both are mean reversion approaches sorry donkin four week rule is not is donkin four week rule one minute yes that is a ta so the donkin four week rule which we also covered belongs to ta and it's a momentum strategy okay not a mean reversion strategy. Okay, guys, please pay attention, including Lakshay, not to your mobile phone. Look at this. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, so when you're doing value in this, to give you a flavor of FA, most of FA is either macroeconomic analysis, which we don't have here, but macroeconomic, let me test once again, value investing. Okay. So if I'm doing, if I'm a value investor and I'm using this as a filter, so should I go for high values or low values? I'm using no you understand no what stock screener you know what you understand what a stock screener is yes, sir. Yes, sir. it's a filtering technique filtering, filtering. okay just like a company comes to the campus and says 
we are so hot that we are only going to interview people who have a you know average grade of uh, you know a minus and above okay so that's a filter i'm just saying that's a, that's a, i'm just giving an example they're applying a filter they are not they're saying we don't want to look at all the students i want to look at only a minus and above okay i'm just saying it's a filter so similarly this is a stock screener is gives you an opportunity to filter okay it's a data manipulation software Okay, there is a database in which there's lots of information on lots of companies on different uh, uh, aspects. And this gives you a way to query the, uh, the database and give out reports. Okay, so you can set multiple filters. So if I'm a value investor and I am filtering companies based on forward PE, what is PE? Okay, good. So forward, if I'm doing so, should I select low values or high values? Low values. Yeah, I'm saying that I'm a value investor. Nikita, should I select low values or high values? Low values? Okay. All right. So then I'll go, let's say, under five. Okay. And what does it do? It immediately gives me 93. Earlier, if you had seen, there would be higher, higher number of stocks. Now, by applying a forward PE below, uh, what did we choose? Five? Yes. Follow, forward P below 5 means immediately the total number of stocks that were shown to me now has been cut down to 93. Okay, so only 93 stocks meet past this filter that uh, only 93 stocks have a forward P less than 5. Is this clear? That's okay. I'm just giving an example. You can use PEG also. Okay, uh, so but PEG is not very commonly used. PEG is not very commonly used in the market. More common is forward PE and sometimes just current PE. Okay, but forward PE is the most common. Okay, forward PE is the most common. So um, anyway, so this is an example. You guys can play around with this. Okay, I'll just add. I think this is already in your sh uh, sheet. Uh, but I'll just add it to your all right so this is one filter okay so now you can keep on adding other filters and keep on reducing the number of stocks okay if you want to build a portfolio with only 30 stocks you can keep applying filters until the number reduces all right so if I use um, sales growth past five years if I use uh, over five percent let's say then it'll go down from 93 to 35 can you see that are you guys seeing that okay so now this gives me there are only 35 stocks which have forward PE above uh, below five and have in and plus they have sales growth over the past five years over five percent okay so that's how you use this stuff okay so i've given you the link please play around with it okay so this is your brief introduction to um, fa and ta there's actually this is a very big topic so we can do this uh, we are going to do this in greater detail later on but if we come back to tam versus am so the point number eight is that the dominant forecasting paradigm in TA is only FA, but in TAM is only FA and the other one is both FA and TA. Okay. So that, that finishes this particular topic. Okay. Why is there noise coming? Is it? So we have 2.5 minutes. Yes, sir. 2.5 minutes. 2.5 minutes. Okay, we'll see. <laughs> this is actually the lunch break. Yes, yes sir. sir. Okay, okay, okay. Then I can uh, give you a little bit of a leeway. Of leeway. One minute. But we still have time. One minute. 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 Okay. Guys, now one more thing. Let's give some instructions at least. Nikhil okay so uh, so Nikhil also should lose minus two because it's in the middle of no 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 it is still part of the the class has not been discussed sorry the class has not been I didn't say I said discussed I, the class has not been dismissed where is Nikhil Kriti yeah this is just to make sure that people don't talk until the class is dismissed okay guys we have to do a project on uh, TWS once again. So please make sure, I hope I sent you that message earlier. I make sure that your three IDs, one ID should remain pure, no trading in that ID, but make sure that that ID also works. Okay. So just see if the feed is coming properly. You can go up to the point of transmitting the order because when that error message comes the error message comes out saying you don't have real-time data for this order mm -hmm. that's what we don't want to see so take any kind of contract just enter the data for Facebook during US trading hours 
wait till you are trading at 8 p.m. Okay. Then otherwise, if you open up the oil futures contract, okay, or copper futures or something, and then test it during any time you want, gold futures, okay. And make sure you try to uh, try to do a trade. Don't actually do the trade in the account which has to be protected, okay, uh, for your actual project trading. But go up to the last point of transmitting just before transmitting, okay, the order. Then before that itself, you'll get the message. If there's a problem with the account, you'll get the message saying you don't. You are about to enter a trade in a market where you don't have live data. Okay, you get that warning message. Make sure you don't get that message. Keep all the three accounts active. Just get in every day and in the practice accounts, go in every day and do some bank, bank, buy, sell, whatever you want to do. Okay, keep it active. Make sure you do some trades. Okay, so uh, and keep them active and then we'll talk about the project as such. So is it how, how many people have not done that? Have not done this. How many people have not tested this? All groups have tested? What? I'm not getting a response either way. Yes, sir. All groups have tested. Yes, sir. Yes. <coughs> so why have you not done it? So make sure one minute. Okay, guys, let's get this. I understand it's, it's still not time for lunch. Okay, just wait, guys. One minute. Let's get this instruction very clear. All teams must do what I've just mentioned. Is this clear? All three accounts given to you. Make sure tomorrow I want a full report okay make sure that all accounts are working try to do a trade in the actual project trading account don't press that transmit in the other two practice account you can trade as many times as you want mm. make sure you don't get any message saying try out us tickers like facebook twitter etc and try to trade during us trading hours you need those us equity because this is a us equity option trading project make sure enter projects uh, enter tickers like amzn amazon okay. facebook twitter and try to do trades in your practice account okay is this clear all right so tomorrow i want a full progress report from all the groups is this clear that all three accounts that you have in your group you should give me a progress report on that okay because then based on that i need to go back to the broker all right so okay all right okay class dismissed so you have you, I still owe you 15 seconds yes, sir. Yes, sir.